welcome to another program of Storytime with Bill. I'm Bill Dunlap and I'm your storyteller. Some of my stories are new and some of them are centuries old. But all of them are designed to lighten your heart and maybe give you a general golden nugget about human nature. A story about a burglar. It was a burglar who cased a house in a very affluent part of town. He saw when the people had left and the house was dark. He decided it was time to make his entry. So he worked his way into the house through a, through a back window and he took his flashlight and shined it around the room and he saw a beautiful CD player that he wanted. So he went over, disconnected the wires and put the, put the CD player in his duffel bag. As he did so, he heard a disembodied voice say, Jesus is watching you. He froze. He turned off his flashlight. There wasn't another sound. There was nobody in the room. You would have heard them. You would have heard them breathing, if nothing else. So he turned his flashlight back on, and he shined it around the room, and he saw a beautiful tea service. So he went over, and he put the tea service into his duffel bag. Again, he heard that disembodied voice say, Jesus is watching you. He turned on his flashlight and he flashed it all around the room. And finally, in a corner of the room, he saw a parrot sitting on its perch. He said, were you the person talking to me? The parrot said, yep. Well, what's your name? Moses. Now what kind of stupid people would name a parrot Moses? The parrot replied, the same stupid people who named their Rottweiler Jesus. My next story is going to be about a tailor who lived in an ancient land called Persia. More recently it's been called Iran. This was a, a very famous tailor, known throughout the Middle East for his fine quality of his work. The problem is, he spent all his time making clothes for other people. He made clothes for kings and queens, prime ministers, statesmen, noblemen of all types. But he never had time to make clothes for himself. His clothes became very, very shabby and dirty. Why, his wife was ashamed to be seen with him when they went to church. On the Sabbath, his wife wouldn't even sit near him. He used to have to sit in the back of the church all by himself because he was such a disgraceful looking person. Still, when it came to making clothes, he was considered almost a genius. One day, without his ever ordering him, a bolt of beautiful silk cloth appeared at his doorstep. He had never seen such magnificent cloth. It was of all colors. It was brown, green, blue, yellow, red, every color you could possibly think of. The tailor held that cloth up to the sunlight and he looked at it. He fell in love with that cloth and he decided that he was going to ignore all of the orders that he had and he was going to make something for himself. He decided he'd make a great coat for himself. So he stitched and he sewed and he snipped and he cut. And at the end of the day, he had a beautiful, multicolored coat. It went all the way down to his feet. And he was so proud of that coat. He wore it home. He wore it during dinner. Why, he even wore it to bed. He wore it at work. He wore it at play. He never took that coat off. But in time, the coat became a little bit soiled, a little bit ragged. And he decided that he should do something about it. He said, Sarah. Sarah, what am I going to do with my beautiful coat? It's, it's looking rather tattered. She said, throw it away. I hate that coat. But he said, no, I'm a tailor. I can make something out of it. So he cut and he snipped and he stitched and he sewed and he made himself a very short jacket. And he was so proud of that jacket. He wore it all the time. He wore it at work. He wore it at play. He wore it at home, he wore it outside, he wore it to bed, he never took it off. But in time it too became soiled, besides he wasn't the very, very most genteel eater. He got food all over it and it began to look bad and smell bad and he said, Sarah, 
What am I going to do with my lovely jacket? It looks so, so tattered and dirty. She said, throw it away. I can't stand that cloth. He said, no, I'm not going to throw it away. I'm a tailor and I can make something out of it. So he cut and he, and he, he cut and he snipped and he stitched and he sewed and he made himself a tie. Oh, it was a beautiful tie. He loved that tie. And he wore it at work. He wore it at play. He wore it at home. He wore it out in, in, the, in the village. He wore it to bed. He never took that tie off. But not being a very careful eater, the tie got terribly stained with food. And he looked at it and he said, Oh, Sarah, look at my beautiful tie. It's so dirty. I, I don't know what I'm going to do with it. And she said, Throw it away. I hate that cloth. He said, No. I'm a tailor and I can make something out of it. So he made a button. He covered the button with his beautiful, with the remnants of his beautiful tie. And he sewed it on his old jacket. And he was so proud of that, he wore that button on his jacket everywhere. And one day, during a rainstorm, the threads broke. And the button fell off his coat and rolled into the gutter and it swept out into the sea. And he went home and he said, Sarah, I've lost my button. I've lost the last of my lovely bolt of silk cloth with so many beautiful colors. She says, I am glad. I am so happy you've gotten rid of it. I've always hated that bolt of cloth. You finally were done with it. He said, no, I'm not only a tailor, I'm a storyteller. And I can make a story out of it. And that's the story I've just told to you. There were three friends who had been, they'd been friends from high school and through college, and they were gathered for a 25-year reunion on, on the beach in Maui. And as they walked along the beach, kicking at the sand with their sneakers, they kicked up a bottle. Oh, they thought, oh, let's open this bottle. Perhaps, perhaps someone put a message in it, and, and we can find out where that message came from, and we'll answer them back. We'll send them an email. So they worked and worked and worked, and pop, cork came out of the bottle, and a genie appeared and said, oh, thank you, thank you. I've been in that bottle for 600 years. I'm so happy to be free and out in the world. The world's so beautiful after being cooped up in that bottle. I'm going to give you three wishes. The men said, well, you know, there's three of us. Each one of us will take one wish. The first man was a very prominent scientist. He had a modest home. He had an old car, but it ran well. He had a beautiful wife and a child. He said, you know, I have everything I want. I just wish I was 10 times smarter. The genie said, poof, you are now 10 times smarter. The second man said, I'm very well to do. I have a luxury car. I have a, a very fine house. I have a wife and I have three children. But you know, all of my life, that man, that scientist, has always been smarter than me. He's always intimidated me. I hope that I, I, I want to just be smarter than he is. Genie, make me a hundred times smarter. So poof, the genie said, you are now a hundred times smarter. The last man said, I'm very wealthy. I have a mansion for a house. I have a fleet of cars and a chauffeur to drive them. I have maids that, to cater to my every whim. I have a wife, I have seven children, and I have a yacht. But you know, I was always the dummy in the class. And people used to make fun of me because I got such poor marks. And here I am, the most successful of all of them. But they'll still look down on me. Genie, I want you to make me a thousand times smarter. Genie said, poof, you are now a thousand times smarter. You're also a woman. And that man is still wandering around today, wondering what transformed him, and his wife is wondering too.
Along the same line, I'm going to tell a story from Greece. It's about, it's called Truth and Falsehood. Now many, many centuries ago, Truth and Falsehood grew up as children together, played in the same schoolyard, had the same friends in town, and then they, they parted. And they didn't meet each other until one time they met at a crossroads. Falsehood said to Truth, and how are you getting along, my friend? He says, oh, very, very poorly. Everywhere I go, there's trouble. And I bring trouble to the people who still love me. It's a terrible life, and it's getting worse every year. Falsehood looked at Truth and said, yes, I can tell by your clothes that you're having a hard time. Your clothes are ragged. And Truth said, worse than that, I haven't had any food past my lips for over a week. I can hardly stand up. False said, come with me. I'll get you a good meal. I'll dress you just like a, a gentleman that I am. Only you have to agree that you will never contradict whatever I say or do. True said, I'm so hungry. I'm famished. I'll go along with you. So they walked into town. They walked into the best hotel in the town. And they sat down and False had ordered a sumptuous meal. He ordered a, a great meal and great drink. And the two of them sat there and, and enjoyed themselves. Truth was very grateful for the opportunity to have something to eat. And after many hours had passed and most of the patrons had left the restaurant, False had reached out and banged his fist on the table. The hotel keeper, seeing that False had looked like a noble gentleman, came over himself to see what was, what was wrong. Falsehood said, when am I going to get my change? I gave a sovereign to that waiting person, and he has never brought me back my change. The hotel owner called the serving person, and the boy said, I have, why, that man didn't give me anything. He hasn't paid a pence. Falsehood, well, in a fine hotel like this, I didn't think they would rob their customers. Here, take this sovereign and bring me back the change, and I'll remember this next time I'm in town. Well, the hotel keeper knew that a fine gentleman lo looking like a falsehood wouldn't tell a lie, so he handed back the sovereign and told the wait person to bring back the change for the sovereign that was never paid. When he brought it back, uh, the falsehood gladly took the money, and the hotel owner beat up the young lad who had not received any money at all. He protested that he had not been paid but he was beaten up and kicked out of the restaurant. When Truth and Falsehood left the restaurant, the young man said, Oh, Truth, where are you? Are you no more, Truth? And through clenched teeth, Truth said, Yes, I am here. But I had not eaten in a week, and I was desperately hungry. But in exchange for a food, I agreed not to speak. You're going to have to get yourself out of this mess. My tongue is tied. Then Falsehood looked at Truth and said, Ha ha, you see how easy it is? Why, well, I not only got a grand meal, I came out with more money than I had when I started. And Truth said, I would sooner die of hungry than connive the way you do. And he walked away. Truth and Falsehood have never ever met again. And in my estimation, they never <laughs> There was a, a woodsman living by the side of a, of a stream, and he made his money by chopping down trees and cutting up up into firewood that he sold to the people in the nearby village. He had one axe. It was a, his prized possession. It was the tool that he used to earn a living. His living just supported himself and his children. But he was a cheerful person, and he went out, and every day he chopped the wood, cut it up into kindling, and sold it to the villagers. There was one day he went out, and he picked out the tallest tree in the forest, and he decided he would fell that tree. So he worked and worked. He worked all morning long, but he wasn't even halfway finished cutting through the, the, the trunk of the tree. And he sat down by the side of a stream to enjoy his lunch. And as he sat there, he kind of dozed off, and in dozing off, his prized axe slipped out of his hands, 
slid down the grassy bank and into the stream. When the woodsman broke up, woke up, he saw that his axe was missing. He looked into the stream. He knew it was in the stream, but he couldn't see it. He dived into the stream himself, but he couldn't get to the bottom. It was so deep at that point. And he went back up and he climbed back up on the, on the side of the bank and he began to cry. His only means for supporting his family was at the bottom of that bottomless stream. And along came a stream fairy. And she said, what is the matter, sir? He said, I've lost my axe. I can no longer afford to support my family. My axe is at the bottom of the stream. And the stream fairy said, I will find it for you. And she dived into the, into the water and she came back with an axe that had a blade of solid gold. The woodsman said, no, I'm sorry, that's not my axe. So the stream fairy laid it beside him and she dived into the stream again. She came back with another axe. The blade was solid silver. And the woodsman said, no, I'm sorry, that's not my axe. My axe has a steel blade, a sturdy, sharp steel blade and a hickory handle. So the fairy dived into the water a third time and she came back with a blade that was encrusted with fine jewels. He said, no, no, that's not my axe. My axe has this fine steel blade. It's sharp as a knife and it has a hickory handle. You, could you see if you could find it? The stream fairy dived into the water again. She came back with the woodsman's axe. He says, yes, that's my axe. Now I can support my family. Thank you so much for your help. You can take those other axes back with you. She said, no, you're an honest woodsman. And you turn down the great treasures of these wax axes because you are honest. I'm going to leave them with you. The woodsman took them back to his family. They were worth enough to support his family in style for generations to come. But no, even today, he still goes out and uses his sharp steel bladed axe to cut down trees, to make into kindling, to sell to the villagers. The gold, the silver, and the jeweled axe, why those are for his children when they grow up to save them from having to live the same modest life as he and his wife. Many, many years ago, I contracted an illness that kept me in the hospital for exactly one year to the day. I was paralyzed for the first few months I was in the hospital. Eventually, I got to the point where I could roll around the hospital floor using a wheelchair. And I used to like to go down to the maternity ward. There in the waiting room, they had the most up-to-date magazines and up-to-date papers. And I could always tell for, for the husbands that had, were expecting their first child as opposed to those who had had children previously. The ones who had had previous children, why, why they were sitting quietly putting together puzzles. I saw one man making a model airplane. But, but the first time fathers, they paced and paced. They were so anxious and so nervous. They perspired profusely. There was one time when a man perspired and he and, and walked around. He paced back and forth, back and forth all for an interminable period of time. Finally, the nurse came out and said, Oh, Mr. Johnson, I'm very happy to tell you that your wife just gave birth to a beautiful baby boy. He said, Oh, that's wonderful, wonderful. I always wanted a baby boy. The first child's a son. I am so grateful. I want to go see my wife. And the nurse said, No, no, no. Just wait a while. She's still in the delivery room. Uh, as soon as the doctor gets her cleaned up, you'll be able to go in and see her. I guarantee it. The man resumed his pacing, back and forth, back and forth. After what seemed like a terribly long time, the nurse came to the door and said, Mr. Johnson, I have great news for you. Your wife just gave birth to a beautiful little baby girl. And he said, oh, that's absolutely wonderful. I wanted a boy. My wife wanted a girl. We have, both of us have what we want. I, I, I'm so happy. Let me go see my wife. The nurse said, no, 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 Mr. Johnson, she's still in the delivery room. As soon as the doctor gets her cleaned up, you'll be able to go in and see her, I guarantee it. He paced and paced and paced and paced, and the nurse came out again, said, Mr. Johnson, we didn't expect this. The doctor had no idea, 
but your wife just gave birth to another baby girl. You have triplets. He says, oh, I'm so happy. I have a whole family with once. Why, this is wonderful. Let me see my wife. And she said, no, 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 no. She's still in the delivery room. You have to wait. And then you can go in, I guarantee it. So he paced and paced and paced. And she finally came back and said, Mr. Johnson, you won't believe this. This is the first time this has happened in this hospital for, oh, five or six years. Your wife just gave birth to another baby boy. You have quadruplets. He says, oh, I'm so happy. He rushed into the delivery room and the nurse says, Mr. Johnson, Mr. Johnson, you can't go in there. You're not sterile. He said, you're telling me. <laughs> The laziest boy in England was Jack. They called him Lazy Jack. His mother, who was a widow, used to work in town as a cleaning lady, and then when she got home she would tend to a small garden that she had to provide, that provided vegetables for their table. But Jack, he didn't do anything. During the summer he would just lie around in the sun, and in the winter he would sit in front of the hearth and play with the cinders. He just didn't do anything. Well, he got to be 16 years old, and one time his mother said, Jack, I've had enough of this. You have never done a lick of work in your life. You are the laziest lout that I've ever known. You don't get any porridge tomorrow unless you go out and get a job. Well, the next morning, Jack got up. There was no porridge. His mother had gone to work, and he didn't know how to fix breakfast for himself. He'd never done that. So he walked down the road and he asked a farmer if he could use some help. His farmer said, yes, I'll take you on. So Jack worked all day. At the end of the day, the farmer gave him a penny. Jack had never had a penny in his hand before, so he held it in his hand so tightly. And on his way home, he crossed the bridge and he stood down and, and he walked, looked down and saw the fish playing below. And as he looked and looked, he got so excited, he opened his fist and the penny dropped into the, the lake. He went home and said, Mother, I worked all day and the farmer gave me a penny and I was so excited when I was watching the fish that I dropped it into the lake. She said, Jack, Jack, you are so lazy and you are so dumb. Next time, put it in your pocket. The next day, Jack went out. He got a job with a dairyman. Then he worked all day and the dairyman gave him a jug of milk no top on it, of course. Jack remembered what his mother said. He put the jug in his pocket. And as he walked home and walked up the hill, every time he took a step, some of the milk fell out of the jug. And when he got home, the jug was empty. He said, Mother, I did what you told me. I put the jug in my pocket and all the milk spilled. And Jack, you're not only lazy, you are so ignorant. Next time, next time, Put it on your head. Jack went out. Third day, he got a job with the same dairyman. Only this time, the dairyman gave him a big hunk of cream cheese. And Jack put it on his head. And he walked home. And as he walked home, pieces of the cream cheese fell down onto the ground. And when the rest of the cream cheese got totally entangled in his hair, it was not edible at all when he got home. And his mother said, Jack, Jack. You are the laziest, dumbest, most ignorant lout I've ever imagined. Next time, put it in your hands. So Jack went out the fourth day. At the end of the day, the farmer gave him a cat. Jack put the cat in his hands, and he carried it home. But it was an old tom cat, and he didn't like being carried. He didn't like leaving his home. So he clawed at Jack, he bit at Jack, and Jack's hands got very bloody. His face was scratched. Jack got almost home and he couldn't stand the pain anymore, so he let the cat go. Jack got home, told his mother that the farmer gave him a cat, and, and he did what she said. I carried it, I carried it in my hands. And Jack, Jack, you, I don't know what I'm going to do with you. You're lazy, you're ignorant. Next time, put a string around it and lead it home at the end of a string. So Jack went out, and he, he got a job with a cattleman. And at the end of the day, the cattleman gave Jack a side of beef. 
So Jack did what his mother told him. He put a string around it and dragged it behind him as he went down the road. Well, the dogs came out and they bit at the beef. The, the stones and the road eroded the beef. When he got home, all he had was a string around a bone. He said, Mother, I did what you told me. I put a string around it and dragged it behind you. She said, Jack, Jack, next time put it on your shoulders. Well, Jack went out the sixth day and he got a job and at the end of the day the farmer gave him a donkey. He said, Jack, you can ride that donkey back and forth from the farm to your house and he won't, it will save you a long walk. But Jack did what his mother told him. He worked and worked and he heisted that donkey and put it up on his shoulders. But the donkey started nipping at him and kicking him. So Jack, Jack got up on the side of a hill and, and, and he worked the donkey so that the donkey's legs were sticking up in the air. And he started carrying him home on his shoulders. Now on the way home, Jack had to walk through town. And in the town lived the king in a palace. And the king had a daughter. She was very beautiful. But since she was born, she had never spoken a word. The people thought that she was deaf and dumb. But she had such a dour face. She never spoke. She never smiled. The doctor said that the first person who could make her laugh, well, she'd be cured. So the king sent out an edict. He said, the first person who can make my daughter laugh, I will give him her hand in marriage and he can have half of my kingdom. Well, Jack was walking past the castle and that girl with the dour face was looking at him. And she saw the donkey going by on Jack's shoulders with its forelegs straight up in the air and it kicking in the air. She thought that was so funny that she broke out in laughter. And the king kept his word. He let, got Jack married to his princess daughter and they lived in the castle. Jack had half the kingdom and he and his mother and his wife have lived happily ever after. This ends my stories for this session of Storytime with Bill. If you have enjoyed my stories, you found them informative, if you found a nugget of truth, then that's because you have love and compassion in your hearts. If otherwise, why then that's my fault because I was the storyteller. So it was and so it is. You can contact me at 408-776-7662 or you can send me an email at wndstories at earthlink.net.